right, is a um, like an on screen, what the right word is, narrator. So I'm going to turn that on. It is under, just for your information, in case you're a PowerPoint aficionado, under the slideshow setting. Um, see if I have the newest version of PowerPoint here. I don't think so, because that should just be that it plays what you've recorded. So I'll have to look. It's looking a little different than mine at home. It may just be that an update hasn't been installed. We'll get with the, the IT people and find out, because it's kind of neat to have those narrations showing. A lot of times, my students, the students that are computer people, IT people. Um, I said kind of a negative thing last time, right? I said that we might, are, we can be considered antisocial. But another thing that we can be considered that I consider most of my students is really intelligent. And so sometimes watching a presentation, things like this can just be not stimulating enough to keep our attention. That's how we are, our minds wander. That's why I never open my email when I'm listening to somebody because before I know it, I'll be off doing something else. So that narrator kind of helps, you know, because it gives you something else to look at while the presentation is going. So I'll find out why I don't have that option and get it set. Plus, it kind of makes it to where I can be sure you can hear me, because if the narrator can't figure out what I'm saying, my mask is probably blocking everybody from figuring out what I'm saying. So I do really like it, and I'll get it set up and working. In the meantime, however, we'll just go ahead without it. Whenever we start with this introduction to computer programming class, it's always hard for us to not just be like, I want to start coding, I want to start writing Python code. We will, don't worry. We're going to really fast. But before we do, it's best if we know why. Because we can just jump in and start doing stuff, but then we might not be doing it in the best way. So before we do anything with any code, we want to think about what we're trying to do here. And what we're trying to do is solve problems. So as a computer person, a computer pro professional, the problem that I want to solve might be for the company I work for. They might need somebody to figure out how to automate this process that's just taking way too long and requiring too many resources. The problem I want to solve might be something to do with the game. You know, how can I best handle the transition between this level and this level? Or how could I best handle some sort of problem area like that? Or even what do I want it to do? And so no matter what, whether we're working with Python or C Sharp or Java or any other programming language, we're trying to solve problems. So it doesn't really matter what language we're using when we're solving the problems. We're in that problem solving mode. So before we can solve problems, we have to understand what the problem is. Have you ever seen people like that? Do you ever get on Facebook? You see people like that all the time. They're coming up with their own problem, but that's not really the problem at hand. And we want to make sure that when we're solving a problem, we know what the problem is. We might think, well, our problem is, you know, that um, people in Springfield never stop at red lights. Is that a problem? Yes. Well, you know, then we have to go from that. Where does that problem come from? You know, what can we do to resolve it? But as long as we know what the problem is to start with, we know what we're working with. If we said something general like, why are people in Springfield such terrible drivers? That wouldn't really help us very much, you know, because we want to kind of focus in on what the problem is. So if we could get them to stop at red light, maybe that would be a big help. Step two, we want to come up with a plan. How could we? What could we do to try to make them stop? Have you ever almost gotten hit in a light in Springfield? I have several times. I have a Prius, and so it slams on the brakes by itself if something like that is going to happen. And it was a big red brake badge in the middle display. And it's happened a couple of times when I almost got slammed into by somebody running a red light. So I've been happy that it it can do that, because I didn't see them. They were coming from out of nowhere. So, so what kind of plan could I take? 
would it be good if we show people videos? You know, could we start broadcasting things in the newspaper? What in the world could we do to make people aware of this problem so that we can start getting it taken care of? Whatever we do, we've got to come up with a plan. What are we going to do? Then we have to explain it to everybody, right? If we've got this plan, we've got to make sure, you know, the city police know about it, probably city utilities, a bunch of other different agencies and organizations that need to know our plan. And finally, after we implement the plan, execute it, we have to decide, did it work? Did it solve the problem? Did it not solve the problem? You probably all worked with software that didn't come along and do this part, right? Sometimes they just spit it out and they don't ever really care if it actually works. Well, it's important for us to know that it works. So when I am coming up with my plan, one thing that I'm going to do often is develop an algorithm. And an algorithm is just a recorded step-by-step -step process I can do to solve a problem. So here's my problem, my algorithm. How do I get home from here from OTC? Let's see. I leave OTC heading south on Sherman. This is my algorithm. I turn left on Traffic Way. Then I merge on the Chestnut. I turn right on Barnes. And then I turn left on Cherry. And that gets me close to my neighborhood. Now, some questions about this algorithm I have. Is this the only possible solution to get from here to my house? No, I could go lots of different ways, right? This is just the algorithm I've chosen to get from here to my house. So if somebody else were working on this project with me, they might come up with a completely different solution that's still valid, all right? So an algorithm is a solution, but it's not the only solution. I could potentially have lots of different ones. Um, Let's see, what else about it? Would I be able to adapt this algorithm if something were wrong? Let's say I got here and I could have turned left on traffic way. Would I have to adjust my algorithm as I went? I would, and I would be able to, and I could figure out a way to get home. So it's not super hard. So that's all an algorithm is, is a step-by-step -step list of how to accomplish something. So I want you to just take a couple of minutes and work with your group. Yes, sir? Sorry. Uh, oh, you're fine. I saw you had a question. Work with your group, and I want each of you to kind of explain how you would get from campus to your neighborhood. Now, we're not going to have time for all three of you to explain to all three of the others, but I want you to be thinking about how you would develop this algorithm. What if I left out this part about turning left on traffic way? Would my algorithm be valid? It would be buggy, yes. right? My people would like get lost. They wouldn't know what to do because I left out a really important step. So I want you to think about that as you're developing your algorithm. Would this person, your project team, be able to find your neighborhood? Now, don't take them all the way to your house because we don't know each other that well yet. <laughs> Just take them close to your neighborhood. Now, some people to do this are going to have to look at Google Maps because they don't know what the road names are and things like that. And that's fine because we use our phones and things to get us home and we might not exactly know what our algorithm is. So let's, I'm gonna set the alarm for about seven minutes. Work with your group and think about your algorithm. So quick question. Uh-huh. Here's my group. Uh-huh. Oh, okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> your group's got ya. <laughs> So start by writing down a list, and then each of you share with the others and see if it makes sense.
Now you two, I should have told you. Kaylee is on. Kaylee's on the Zoom question, so you guys can get on Discord and talk about this with her. She should. So she is, and you can just send her messages on Discord if you want to start. But ask her what her algorithm would be to get to her neighborhood so that she's not left out. Thanks. She said she was sick and she didn't want to give you guys germs. Wait. <laughs> um, she said. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> She doesn't say. Oh my God. Does she have COVID 19? No. You're okay. I talked to her dad the other day, too, so there's nothing going on in the family. It's probably just too much. Somebody will eventually, huh? I keep trying. It's not so <laughs> We got this. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so I think that sounded like there were some good instructions going on. How do you feel? You think that they could guide you to the right place? Should you trust your city group here to give you directions and you know, algorithms and things you think are okay? I'm pretty good in, in the town I used to live in in Carthage. They built a roundabout and I did mess up a friend with that one time because I gave him instructions on the phone and I said, go straight to Pizza Hut and then take a right. And he called and because we had a roundabout pretty early on before anybody else and he called and he was like, what's this wheel thing? What do I do? And I was like, oh, I forgot about that. Take that second spoke. <laughs> yeah, that's what he was doing. I think he just kept going around. And we actually live by one here in Springfield now. And it is funny every once in a while you'll see people that get a little bit crazy and they see how how many times they can burn rubber around the roundabout. So we like to sit there and watch it. It's very funny to watch them be all crazy and be like. Okay, so algorithms, that's all it is. Step by step list of instructions. That's all an algorithm is. No big deal. It sounds all mathy and stuff, but it's not. So we've got this algorithm then that is a list of steps how we can accomplish some sort of process. What is that compared to programming? Well, programming is just a list of instructions, kind of like an algorithm. It's just that we have to code that list of instructions in such a way that it can be understood by the computer in a different programming language. Programming languages are nothing more than programs that have already been written to understand additional language so that we can generate instructions. So whenever we create these lists of instructions in a programming language, we are programming. We know that it's a really well-paid field, right? And it's worked really good through the pandemic because most software developers were able to work at home without any problem. They continued to make the big bucks and all of that great stuff. It's a lot of money. We have a student who graduated last year who is making, he started out his very first job out of OTC making over $60,000 a year. How does that relate to per hour money? It's a whole bunch, it's a whole bunch more than $10 per hour, let's put it that way. So it is worth it, it's worth it, it's hard because it's not super easy or everyone would do it, right? Or you wouldn't get paid much for doing it if it was easy. So do expect some challenges as you move forward. There are gonna be times that you're gonna be frustrated and it's gonna be worth it. Now this, is a, this video here is getting a little old, but it's still super valuable. I was 13 when I first you know got this access guy? to uh, a computer. My parents bought me a, uh, a Macintosh in 1984 when I was eight years old. I was in sixth grade. I learned to code in college, freshman year, first semester, um, intro to computer science. I wrote a program to play tic-tac-toe. I think it was pretty humble beginnings. I think the first program I wrote asked uh, things like, what's your favorite color? Or how old are you? I first learned how to make a green circle and a red square appear on the screen. The first time I actually had somebody come up and say, hello world, I, didn't, I made a computer do that. It was just astonishing. Learning how to program didn't start off as wanting to learn all of computer science or, um, or trying to master this discipline or anything like that. It just started off because I wanted to do this one simple thing. I wanted to make something that was fun for myself and, and my sisters. And I wrote this little program and then basically just add a little bit to it. And then when I need to learn something new, I looked it up, either in a book or on the internet, and then I added a little bit to it. It's really not unlike kind of playing an instrument or something, or, 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 you know, or playing a sport. It starts out being very intimidating, but you kind of get the hang of it over time. Coding is something that can be learned. And um, I know it can be intimidating, and a lot of things are intimidating, but, uh, you know, what isn't? A lot of the coding people do is actually fairly simple. Um, 
it's it's more about the process of breaking down problems than uh, you know sort of coming up with complicated algorithms as people traditionally think about it. You don't have to be a genius to know how to code. You need to be determined. Addition, subtraction, uh, that, that's about it. You should probably know your multiplication tables. You don't have to be a genius to code. Do you have to be a genius to read? Even if you want to become a race car driver or play baseball um, or, uh, you know, build a house. All of these things have been turned upside down by software. What it is is, you know, computers are, are everywhere. You want to work in agriculture? Do you want to work in entertainment? Do you want to work in manufacturing? You know, it's, it's just all over. <laughs> Here we are, 2013. It's all it's got. To bank information. information. And none of us know how to read and write code. When I was in school, I was in this after school group called the Whiz Kids, and people found out they laughed at me and you know all these things. And I'm like, man, I don't care. I think it's cool and you know I'm learning a lot and some of my friends have jobs. Our policy is literally to hire as many talented engineers as we can find. The whole limit of the system is just that there just aren't enough people who are trained and have these skills today. To get the very best people, we try to make the office as awesome as possible. That's the coolest part. Bob's offices. Bob's offices. <laughs> you have a fantastic chef. Free food. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Free laundry. Snacks. Even places to play and video games and scooters. There's all these kind of interesting things uh, around the office and places where people can play or relax. Um, or go to think, or play music, or be creative. Whether you're trying to make a lot of money, or whether you just want to change the world, computer programming is an incredibly empowering skill to learn. I think if someone had told me that software is really about humanity, that it's really about helping people by using computer technology, it would have changed my outlook a lot earlier. To be able to actually come up with an idea and then see it in your hands and then be able to press a button and have it be in millions of people's hands. Uh, I mean, I, th I think we're the first generation in the world that's really ever had that kind of experience. Just to think that I mean, you can start something in your college dorm room and you can have a set of people who haven't built a big company before come together and build something that a billion people use as part of their, their daily lives is, is just crazy to think about, right? It's really it's humbling and it's amazing. The programmers of tomorrow are the wizards of the future. You know, you're going to look like you have magic powers compared to everybody else. It's amazing. It's, I think it's the closest thing we have to a superpower. Great coders are today's rock stars. That's it. That's some updates here. changed a lot in the last few years. We're working with an administration politically in our country that is not technology oriented, right? I mean, they're against technology. That's all we can say. So we are in a different environment than they were in when they made this video, but coding is still just as important. We saw that in the pandemic. We saw that CIS degrees, number one degree in the country now. That's what everybody wants to do because everybody saw a brother or cousin aunt somebody who didn't have to go to work and didn't have to worry about their job because they were a computer professional. So there is going to be a lot of competition coming up, but you got to stand strong. And just like these people are saying in the video, every single accomplishment that you make matters, whether it's your very first Hello World program, all the way to something that works and runs some sort of major organization. They're all important steps in the learning process, and, and that's where we want to be. Now, 
even though our current administration may not value technology as much as our previous administration, they do realize how critical it is, right? So they are still pushing for people to go into security fields. Our country has put itself at risk by not maintaining a strong software security presence. That's why it's so great we have the new IT degree. We have so many people that are interested in doing that because it's important. We're looking at our, our voting system potentially, potentially being corrupt, right? We need people that know how to protect these systems, that know how to make sure things are not being hacked, nobody is affecting things. So you guys are super important. Don't ever think that you're coming along too late. You know, all the cool things have already been done. All the cool games have already been written. There's nothing left for me. That's not true. You guys have just as many opportunities for advancement as people did back in the 80s. There are just as many opportunities, just as many things that need to be explored and done. So when you see people like this, the people that are the wealthiest people in our country because of their computer technology needs and learning and things, Realize it's a possibility. When you were looking at that Valve kitchen and that Valve cafeteria, pretty cool. All that food is free. So anybody who works there can just ride their little scooter in and get whatever they want for free. A few years ago, I had a student who did an internship at that Apple headquarters in Cupertino, California. And so he was very close to, I think, a lot of Google and a bunch of them have headquarters there in Cupertino. So Derek was... Um, an Apple intern, and he was from Carthage, Missouri. And so he was a small town, Southwest Missouri boy that was highly intimidated. He was paid a lot as an intern to come out there. They put him up in this fancy condo that was on the ocean front. Him and his wife could see the ocean, and they had a great time while they were there. Well, they got married right before they went. So every day before he went to work, his wife, you know, trying to be productive because she really had nothing to do while he was going to work every day, would make him his lunch. Because he's a very economically minded kind of guy. So she would make him his lunch and he would take his little brown paper bag to Apple and he would eat his lunch that she made for him every day and continue working. And about three days before he was done with his internship, because he did not accept the permanent job offer they made to him, but you know, that was their personal decision. But about three days before he left, someone saw him eating that and was like, dude, have you ever been to the cafeteria? And he was like, no, no, me and my wife just got married. We're trying really hard to save money, you know, not waste anything. And they were like, but everything in there is free. And so he said he just really wanted to kick himself because this whole time he could have been eating all this luxurious food in the cafeteria for free if he didn't realize he could. So my point is, those places are out there for you. They are not out there for other people for someone who is better than you or from some big city or something like that. They are completely attainable by you if that's something that you want. So decide what your goals are and work towards them. Derek wanted to work for Apple. That was the thing that he always wanted to do. So he set that goal and he just kept working towards it. How many times do you think Apple would hire an intern from MSSU in Joplin? They call it Joplin U. So I have like two computer teachers, but he was able to because he had the motivation and he gave them the information that they needed and they were super impressed with him. So same with you, anything's possible. Oops, I just hit some button on that thing. I hope I didn't mess it up. So don't ever think that we can't do it. I wonder how things will change now that we're seeing more people working from home. You know, these big corporations that have these really fancy corporate offices like that, you know, is how is this going to impact them? Are they going to send you guys like virtual reality headsets and stuff at home so that they can keep you entertained? All right. So when we're developing software, just like anything else in life, there's usually a cycle, right? We never get done with things. So to develop software, we have this cycle. We analyze our problem. We design some sort of solution. We code the program, we test it, and then we revise it if we need to. Now, if any of you have ever been beta testers for any games or systems like that, 
you've been down here in this testing area. It's a really important part. And as developers, sometimes we forget about that. You know, we expect that once we've done all this work designing and coding, everything's just going to work fine. Well, we know testing is really important and we're going to revise and keep going. So never ending cycle. When we're designing our program, our software, our application, we can have some issues communicating with our users. The user base may not understand some of the technical terms that we use. They may be intimidated by us talking about those kinds of things. They might kind of close up and not give us the information that we need. So we need some way to be able to communicate effectively with them so that we can make sure we've understood what they've told us and they can verify it. One way that we use is pseudocode. And pseudocode is kind of like code, but it's just English-like. So here's an example. This pseudocode I found online, you can tell I just Googled it, and it's kind of like European pseudocode, because they're talking about making a cup of tea. So their pseudocode, which looks a lot like an algorithm, right? Because that's really what it is. It's saying organize everything together. Plug in the kettle. <laughs> Put the tea bag in the cup. Put the water into the kettle. Wait for the kettle to boil. Add the water to the cup. Remove the tea bag with a spoon or a fork add milk or sugar, and serve. Does that sound reasonable? Does it seem like it's got all the steps? It's not any sort of fancy code or anything, but it tells us what we need to do. One thing that I don't like about this example are these semicolons. I've actually seen users who would look at this and say, why are there semicolons in this? Why is it so technical? I can't understand that. So we have to be really careful about things like that. Users can be very, very picky. Now, this program could actually be changed really easily to ask for input, right? Because we could ask the, the user, do you want milk? Do you want sugar? Those would be valid questions, okay? So if we're asking for input like that, we're asking for data. We want to know what the answer is to that question. Whenever we receive data like that, we need to save that input somehow in memory for our program to use. So we're going to use a variable. And you've probably used variables in all sorts of different things. But anytime we want to keep track of data, we're going to use a variable to store that data. So we could ask how many sugars and store the reply in a variable. What would be a good name for a variable that was going to hold how many sugars? What do you think? I can wait. What, well, what character is going to use? Oh, that's a good question. Like, is it all just letters and numbers, or can we actually use like symbols too? That's a really good question, because that might make a difference, right? Say you could use anything in the world. What do you think the best? A good name would be? Um, the number symbol and then sugars. Oh, that makes sense, right? Wants to use that, that hashtag symbol as a number. So I like that. Any other ideas? Just say sugar. What about X? Would that be a good name? No. No, no it wouldn't. <laughs> it wouldn't. We don't want to use names like that. But we will once in a while, just because we're trying to save time. So Tim was exactly right. He brought up, we need to know what our rules are before we can decide what a good name would be. And so these rules are usually followed in most programming languages. Some are going to have a little bit different of a rule for naming variables. But in general, one word, no spaces. Right? If I have a space, now I have two words. So never a space. Cannot begin with a number. Should be meaningful. And we can use long names, but we want to kind of keep it short. Think about that person typing that. And of course, we can copy and paste and stuff, but short, meaningful names are the best. 
Here's some examples. Let me back up because some people were writing those down. Got it? Okay. So here's some examples. Miles underscore traveled. It's okay. What about this one? Is it okay? No. no. What's wrong with it? Space. Is it space? It's bad. What about this? Yeah. Looks good. How about this one? Number. Why not? Number. Starts with a number. It's bad. How about that? Yeah. It's legal. It's kind of not very descriptive though. So it's sort of cautionary. If we had a really short program, it wouldn't matter much. But if we got into something that was pretty, pretty huge, then it would start causing trouble. This one? Eh, probably not. Unless we had a very special use for it and it was really gonna be obvious what was going on there. What about this one? What's wrong with it? Space again. What about that? Why not? Number starting. What about this? <laughs> it's valid, isn't it? It's just really obnoxiously long. <laughs> so we could use it, but it would be ugly. Now there's a special type of variable called a constant. And that's a variable that holds data that doesn't change. One thing that we could use a constant for might be to hold the value of pi, right? Because we might need to use that value in our program, but it's not gonna ever change. It's a constant value. If we were writing an application where we wanted, we figured that everybody was gonna be in our area that used it, we could set up a constant for the area code and say that it's 417, right? So we can, we can do that. Now in our textbook in chapter one, they have some pseudocode for an application called a number of songs application. And they want to ask the user to enter the number of songs they want to purchase. So our idea here is this little application is gonna prompt the user to know how many songs they wanna want to buy. We're gonna read in how many they want. And then we're gonna multiply that by 99 cents, assuming our cost per song is 99 cents. And we're gonna display a message to them. You know, okay, you know, five songs is gonna be this much money. So to get started, we've got some pseudocode here. We're starting out saying we want to prompt them for how many songs they would like to buy. When we're using pseudocode, we're going to use this type of format to say that we want to display something on the screen. We're going to use the keyword write, which means write it out to the screen for the user to see. And then after the keyword right, we're going to have the message that we want displayed on the screen. Our message is usually a string, so it's going to be surrounded by double quotes. Double quote at the beginning of our message string, and a double quote at the end. That's going to sit there on the screen, waiting for the user to type something and press enter. Our program is going to pause in our pretend pseudocode. We know, we know it's going to pause, and it's just going to wait until the user presses enter. When the user presses enter, we're going to input whatever they, they type. Whatever they type then, we're going to save that value in a variable called songs. So now we have a new variable called songs, which is going to be how many songs they want to buy. So some more on inputting from a user. Sometimes we might end our string with a colon and a space so that the cursor is sitting right there ready for the user to type something in. So we need to be real specific with that write statement with exactly what we want displayed on the screen. So here we're saying we're going to ask them for a number and we're going to put a colon and a space at the end of our message so that it all looks nice and pretty waiting for them to type. 
Whenever we write a message to a screen like that, asking the user for input, that's called a prompt. We're prompting them for input. So that's real important in our textbook. They have a bunch of test questions and stuff about it, the prompt. And it's just asking the user. Our input statement, again, always names the variable that's gonna hold the data that the user typed. Here's an example where we might want two numbers. So we could write out the prompt and then input our first number into variable number one, and then input the second number into variable number two. So now our number of song pseudocode is a little bit longer here. We start out with the statement write, writing out the prompt. Then we read in the number that the user types in. The set statement then says, take a variable named dollar price and make it equal to 99 cents times that number of songs that the user input. So that should mean that our dollar price now equals the total. And then we're gonna print that out to the screen so they know what the total cost would be. Now, as we're working with pseudocode, it can be difficult. It's like, I would rather just write the program. Yeah, we would. We would all rather just write the program. But remember, that's not where we are yet. Where we are right now is making sure we got the information down from the user correctly. And we're trying to come up with an English-like list of everything that needs to happen that we can share with them. So it's kind of like an outline in that regard. It's kind of like an outline. And as a programmer, it's really annoying. It's really hard for us to make pseudocode because we all say, and it's very natural, can't I just write this program? And you're absolutely right. If I got you in Python right now, we could write this program almost easier in Python and we can talk about this pseudocode because it's fake. It doesn't do anything, right? It's just, it's just a story. But we've got to write this story, this pseudocode story, to make sure we know what the user wants us to do. Because otherwise, if we start programming, we might be way in over our heads when we find out there was a little detail that had been left out. So we got to write the story before we can write the code. So here they said they wanted 74 songs. Our pseudocode is going to multiply that 99 cents times those 74 songs, and we're going to output our dollar price. Now, in the presentation, I kind of point out our 99 cents could be set up as a constant variable, right? Because it never changes in our code. So we could use that as a constant variable. Now, assigning a value to a variable, we always use an equal sign. So this statement sets the value of the variable number x to 45. In our textbook, they like us to use this keyword set so that it makes us remember we're changing the value of a variable. When we're writing actual program code, we probably won't have to do anything like that. Again, writing the story can be kind of difficult when we're wanting to write the code. But this is an assignment statement because it assigns a value to a variable. Now in this one, what's the name of the variable that is having a value assigned to it? Number X, right. And what's the value? 45. So. Could we switch it? Could I say set 45 equal number X? No. I could do that if it was math, right? Because a formula is the same either direction, but not when I'm coding because that's not what this is. This is setting a value in a variable. So the variable name has to come before the equal sign and the value has to come after. What's this one gonna do? It's gonna update that number X value to what? 97. 
Now, when we're coding and doing pseudocode, we of course can do math. And we always get to math when we're talking about programming because people don't like doing math. And so computers were invented to do math for us, right? Because we don't want to do it anymore. So doing math is very important. So if we want to add two numbers, we can. You can do subtraction. Each of these could be a variable name besides a number. Multiplication is always an asterisk. Regular division is slash. Exponentiation is the little hot caret symbol. It's your shift six. Find it on your keyboard so you know where it is. So this formula is two to the power of three. So that caret symbol does exponentiation. And then modulus is the percent sign. This one is very interesting. Modulus does division and then returns to you the remainder. So if I divide 14 by 3, I get 4 with 2 left over. So that gives me that 2. We can use that in a lot of different ways. Now when we're working with arithmetic, just like in algebra class, we have to make sure we're doing things in the correct order. We're going to use the standard order of operation or operator precedent. And the memory aid for that is PEMDAS. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Parentheses come first, then exp exponentiation, then multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. So whenever we're looking at a big long formula, we're always going to apply the order of operations to it to determine what has to happen first. So what about this one? What's going to happen first? Six plus two, and then what? Seven minus five. Seven minus five. And I'm not going to write it down on the board because it's too confusing. But we'll have a lot of opportunities to experiment with some. Just remember those order of operator precedence does apply. When we finished our little pseudocode, we had the last statement saying, just write out the dollar price. Put it on the screen so they can see it. Well, that's not very meaningful, is it? 7226, it might not mean anything to the person. So it's always nice to annotate our output, which means add a little bit more to it, make it prettier. So here we've annotated, and instead of just writing out the dollar price, we're going to write out this message, the cost of your purchase is, and the dollar price. So that plus sign there, when we're working with this string in this dollar amount, puts the two strings together. So our output is going to end up being the cost of your purchase is 73.26. So when I'm working with strings, the plus adds the strings together. And that's called concatenation. When I'm concatenating different things that are strings. So we're going to annotate our output and make it all pretty. When we're working with variables, some programming languages like to know what kind of data we're going to keep in that variable. Some are pretty flexible about it. We're going to find out, sorry, that as we use Python, it's pretty flexible about data types. It'll kind of figure it out for you. C Sharp and Java, the other programming languages that we use here at OTC, are really type specific, so they're real picky about it. So it's like from one extreme to another. Now, common data types that we could have for variables. First of all, a character. And a character means one character, like the letter N. That would be a char or a character data type. Whenever we're working with character data, we usually enclose it within single quotes. Now, the integer data type is a number, but it's a number without a decimal part. 
So an integer can only be a whole number. Conversely, a floating point is a number that has a decimal part. So here, 43.71 would be a floating point type of data. And Boolean is something that's either true or false. Sometimes we need that in our code. Now, one that's not on this list, or I, I skipped over, it is on this list at the very top, is string. And a string is one or more characters. They can be alphabetic, special characters, numbers, whatever. Anything can be called a string. And whenever we're using a string, we always enclose it in the double quote. So string is double quotes, char character is single quotes. Here is another example of concatenation. In this case, we're writing out this message that's going to say the output is one and two and three. So whenever we're concatenating like this, you have to look really closely and make sure that you have matched sets of double quotes and that the plus signs are outside of the double quotes. So we're saying string plus variable name one plus a string plus a variable name two. So it can get pretty interesting when we're concatenating a lot of output. And we'll have to work to make sense of all of those double quotes and things like that. Now, because things can kind of look rather cryptic like this once in a while as we get to coding, we've come up with some standards over the years to help programmers understand what's going on, what other people have done. First of all, Camelback notation. And I've seen lots of different names for it, but they always say Camelback. Camelback simply means we use all lowercase, but we have uppercase at the beginning of every word. And that helps people when they're looking at it, see that what it says. Now this one that starts with an uppercase letter, I've heard it called upper camel case. This one, lower camel case. Our textbook refers to lower camel case as camel case, so that's fine. But you can see the differences. Now the third common convention that people use is an underscore. Take a look, which ones do you like better? Mm -hmm. Do you like the underscore? Some people do. What they've decided, I think, over the years is that the underscore is another character. And so people have sort of veered away from that way of doing things more towards the lower camel case because then we would have tops rate with an uppercase R and it would be one less character, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if you're typing, you know, 50,000 of those underscores a day, it starts adding that. So, but different programming languages like different ways of doing it. So depending on the language you're using, you might run across a language where the convention is to put two underscores at the beginning of every variable name. I've seen that too. We just want to stick with whatever the convention is. So finally, we're seeing that getting into computer programming, our main purpose here is to solve a problem. And we have to define that problem before we can solve it. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how we look at it, that problem solving is going to involve communicating with other people to get input and find out more about the problem. We want to document what we find when we communicate, and a good way to do that is to use pseudocode. Pseudocode is just a list of steps. It's the story of our program, and it should be readable by technical and non-technical people. So let's look at that pseudocode that we have in Canvas. I'm going to have to get out of this student view. And I want this week one lab reorder the pseudocode. Now, before we try to open it, 
This one uses an Office 365 document. So let's click on Office 365 over here and make sure we're logged on. I am, I can see all of my OneDrive files. So you should see something like that. If it prompts you to log in, just use your OTC account. And if you're at home, you might have to do this Office 365 link and log in before you can see this properly. So this is what it should look like. Oh, someone saved it. Get back out of it. Let me fix it. It's not very hard. <laughs> it won't let you see it? Oh, good. So I can fix it before you can get in it. Hang on. <laughs> That's no good. I want you to be able to see it. I don't know if it's going to let me fix it or not. We'll see. Hang on, hang on. Silly thing should be letting you see it. Let me fix that. Okay, refresh and you should be able to open it. Let's make sure you can. Technical stuff. Can get to it? It's too hot in here. Not hot, not bad. Is it open for you? Sort of. Not even that big of an assignment. Oh, there. Some are opening. You guys see? Now, this zero code is really short. And what we want is for it to be in the right order, because it's not in the right order. Now, it's also got some things in it that we hadn't really talked about too much yet. So I kind of want you to save this and work on it at home when you're looking at your book and thinking about what order it should be in. You can see why I wanted everybody to get it open here, just because it's a bit of a problem sometimes to do that. So if you can't get it open at home, send me a message in this course so we can figure that out. Now, all you need to do is each line of pseudocode here needs to be duplicated down below the prompt for the correct order. So we just want to make sure it's all in the right order. Because order matters, just like we saw with my algorithm of getting home. If I said to turn left on traffic way first, you wouldn't even be at traffic way and it would be a big mess. And that's how programming is, we want to do it in the right order. Okay, so let's get out of that. Everybody can access it. Try to do that one over the weekend. And we'll talk about it on Monday and make sure that it's all done for everybody because it's not due until Tuesday. So we have time to do that. Now let's go back to our modules and let's try to see how many technical difficulties we can have with the review questions. Every time I try to use Office 365 for stuff, 
it can cause trouble. Okay, this one is definitely troublesome. When you get into this assignment, it's a Windows form. So you know how Google Forms work so great? We don't actually have student accounts for Google. We have them for Microsoft products. So I've tried to set up Microsoft Forms. They just don't work quite as great as the Google Forms do. So it'll be a little kludgy. But let's click fill out the form. And it, it knew I was logged in before, but now it doesn't. And finally, what you should see is these chapter one review questions. Put in your name for me, because it's only gonna give me your account. I wanna ask a question, I don't really have the book for this yet. Uh -huh. I'm gonna get it today, but uh -huh. is this prelude to programming? Uh -huh. it's prelude, to programming. prelude to programming, yes. Okay, I was curious. Yes, that's the one you want. And so it's prelude to programming, Page 61 are where you're going to find these questions, right? So if you've got your book, flip it open and let's take a look at it. I'll try to bring up the book online so we can see it all together. I'm so sorry, I can't hear you at all. You'll need the Python book too, yeah. And it's like five bucks. It's a real cheap book. <laughs> it's definitely worth buying. Wasn't it like five bucks, that Python book? Because if it was, you could buy it off Amazon for like five bucks. It's, it's, a, it's a very, um, must have been published a billion times because it is cheap. All right, so I'm going to try to bring up the book online. All right. Well, it's decided I don't have access to it. I forgot about that one because it did not get ready. Okay, so what's question number one? Because if you notice, this form doesn't tell you what the question is. You actually have to look at the book. How mean is that? That's really mean. And the reason is sometimes we have students that try to not buy the book. Can you believe that? And so it's really important to have the textbook in this class. So that's why these questions are actually set up this way. So you can help people that are in your study group, you know, a time or two, like you can tell they don't have the book. But then after that, you kind of need to push that baby out of the nest and let them go off on their own to find their books, right? Because it's really important that they have it. So tell me, what is question number one? Because I don't have my book. Your computer blank is a list of instructions to be executed by the computer to accomplish a certain task. Okay, did you hear? A computer blank is set up to accomplish a certain task. Program, I heard it. Now, we're not going to do all these together, but I wanted to show you how this works. I've typed in this one answer. I'm going to go ahead and click somewhere else, and then I'm going to close out of this form. So my, I'm going to pretend my kid's called. I'm, I don't have time to do this right now after all, so I'm going to close it. Now, am I going to lose that answer? That's what I want you to see. You should not. If you come back in to fill out the form again, 
It's made a liar out of me. <laughs> Why did you lose it? It's never lost that before. Anybody else try it? Does it lose yours too? It loses it? Now it kept it. So let's just say it's kind of kludgy at best. So if you can, you might want to zoom in just a little bit and use that snipping tool or something to just take a snip of what your answers were before you close out of it, just in case it does something weird, just so you don't have to worry about losing them. And then that way, if you want to keep your answers, you can too. Now, sometimes people will use another sheet of paper and just write their answers down and then come to the form and just fill it out all at once and submit it. That's okay too. Now, I know these things are kind of difficult. It's kind of um, unreliable. So I'll help you with these. But when you've got all the answers done and you're through with it, then click submit. And that'll actually send those answers to me. Then you should be done with that assignment. You should get an email that your answers were submitted. So again, it's Microsoft, but sometimes it doesn't type it. But hopefully it will. Okay, so any questions? I've given you your pseudocode to do finish over the weekend. And be sure to answer questions for the weekend. Any questions about them before we get out of here? Good? But you're welcome to stay and work on those. You're welcome to get out of here if you're ready. But either way, I'll see you Monday. Do we have a turn in our uh, um, on reordering of this code? Can we edit the document and do it in there? Can you edit the document when you come back? And so, like, it takes one, and so it should be able to submit this right now. Yeah, that's really fine. All right, thank you. Okay. 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 Don't leave your first. Yes, the first. Thank you. Don't leave without your in your area. I my body in front of the door. <laughs> <laughs>
through the chapter okay. and you should get to feel uncomfortable about it. Okay. When does your next class? Oh thank you. I you guys are it. Oh okay. Well I don't think I can have this Oh <laughs> yeah I gotta get my subscription reactivated that always happens every time I put it open. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I well, just had to go through the whole process. It, you know, not, they change the whole process every every three days. Every three days, right? Yeah, we read it in the grant and um, well, <laughs> it's kind of bad because the way things evolve, you he, he wish to say he got a job in central leadership and he was a in the So he did. So, according to my dad's wife, he's limited to three. Right here, if you try to write out 
the value of C. What is the value of C right now? Oh, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's the only problem. So now, good. in the same way, we don't have a value of F yet. Okay, so I'm going to put it at C goes to C. I have to make sure it's all in the right order so it has what it needs if it moves down. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Really? Well, it's a hard um doing the group I think that hopefully will help us with the pandemic just really help us last and after we all online because people were able to kind of help each other. Well, you know, and that's the thing. Honestly, when class starts to my clerk, I have a lot of people who bring so much yeah. after we switch. Yeah, because they do say we did our Zoom time the same time as our regular class. And honestly, sometimes we just kept going. You know, because people would have problems or one person wouldn't be it. And so we would just stay. And, you know, that's people true. would drop would end out of the Zoom session because they knew what was going on, but other people would just say, oh, and I think it really worked out, out. Mm -hmm. you know, for some people a lot better than, than having to come and go. I don't know. To me, I'm real, um, I'm real vocation oriented. Sometimes I can just think better at home, and I think a lot of us are that way. And, yeah. and once they got their offices set up at home, it seems like they were able to, to really focus I don't think I'm not sure that I really keep it that often. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you.